Today we're talking about wedding photography. But you already knew that because you clicked the, the link that had the word in it. Welcome to Wedding Photography Weekly, the weekly show. It's going to continue to evolve. This is, this is week number two. It started, the, the bones of it will remain as a Q&A style show, podcast, I guess it, it originally began. And if you're part of the members Facebook group, so you have to be a, a part of the member website. And if you are, you can come over to the members group. And I put up a topic usually the day before I record this. And you can ask any questions that you might have on that current week. And I will get to them the, the following day. Uh, also, if you are in the members group and you're part of the membership team, uh, you are able to sign up for the weekly photo contest. So there's a photo challenge every single week. And you win $100 if you, if you are the lucky winner. This week, the topic is black and white. So any black and white photo, any style, it doesn't have to be a wedding or portrait image. It can be really anything. And there is a lot of incredible work up there already. The way that it's going to go moving forward, I believe, uh, we're going to get kind of a top 10 list. So the top 10 images that have the most likes, you can vote with your, with your like. You can like as many images as you want. Uh, in the actual thread, those go to kind of the, the second round. And then voting on those 10, 12 images, whatever it ends up being, uh, will we'll begin on, I guess, Monday next week and the winner gets $100. So, so join up over there if you're a member and enter every single contest. And it's an excuse to, one, maybe go back through your archives or two, and create something that maybe you usually wouldn't. And I don't know, it's, a, it's an excuse to get a little bit more creative. You might notice in my hands, I have this tiny little film camera. This is a, a Nikon EM. And the reason that I actually bought it was one, because I wanted like a tiny little film camera. And then it came with this bonus lens. This is a free lens and it is the 50 millimeter 1.8E, which is a lens that I actually sold earlier this year. And I am sad that I did so. I use this as, um, as a 50 millimeter kind of vintage style lens. It's also like as a 50, it's manual focus, but it's one of the smallest 50s that Nikon makes probably the smallest 50 that Nikon makes. Uh, we took this to Japan, and if you've seen the uh, landscape photography course, you've seen at least some of the footage from it and some images from it. But what I was sad about is looking back at the, the photos and, the, and specifically the video footage on the Nikon Z6 after I sold the, sold the lens, I really wanted it back. It, it created something that I hadn't really seen from any lens, so stay tuned for more, more testing on this. This is coming with me. Tomorrow we are off to do a helicopter elopement. So we are getting in a helicopter, weather dependent, and going out and taking some, some hopefully beautiful wedding images with a very nice sunset in the background. And I'm gonna be bringing this. And in this camera, since it's a 35 millimeter film camera, I will likely either be using uh, tomorrow I'll probably go, so Portra, I'm gonna go color because it's gonna be a nice sunset-y scene. Black and white doesn't really make a whole lot of sense and if it's overcast, we're probably going to try to push to the next day in order to get a nice sunset. Um, overcast, I'd probably be shooting uh, 400 Tri-X in here. On a sunny day, I'm likely going to be Portra 800 or Portra 400. Um, those, I would say 800's always my favorite, but 400 is my, my second favorite. Um, it's also that you're stuck like 800 ISO film, you have to shoot at 800 ISO, which means I might have to be riding the, the aperture and I have to be somewhere that is a little little further from wide open where I, I kind of like the look the best. So yeah, we'll see how this performs tomorrow. Uh, Friday, Lindsay and I actually had our first wedding of, I think Lindsay did one in, in February 28th or something was her last wedding. My last wedding was I think back in November. Um, I. It was, I was an unhired second shooter, so I, I, I was not a paid, paid photographer. Uh, what happened was we were on our way to our place in Collingwood, which is like two hours north of here, and the wedding is kind of just off center of that line a little bit. So we were driving, and it would have been weird for me to just sit in a car and not do anything for the, the two and a half, three hours that she was at the wedding. So I went out with my Leica M10 and a 90 millimeter f2.8, and it is a manual focus experience, and it is a very difficult, manual focus experience if you used a like or any rangefinder, I guess like you kind of focus left to right so you're tracking you're trying to line it up you can do some like the easy way I think with rangefinders if you if, if you're bad at it and I was for a very long time is that I always go to full infinity on on my focus and I always stay there and I pull back so I, I kind of come back it goes I guess that eh, goes the same way. Um, but I always roll back from infinity to my focus point, And I find that that's way better than just leaving it randomly somewhere and trying to figure out where I'm at whenever I'm trying to focus. That said, you're going to see a lot of failure. I'm going to say the entire day 
was me failing to get any great images. Uh, manual focus, 90 millimeter Leica life is not a wedding life that I would ever desire. I'm happy I did it, but I thought that it was gonna be amazing and I thought that I was going to create a lot of really cool images to show to you guys and it turns out that it's just, it was really hard. So I'll make the video and I'll talk about how, how difficult it was and uh, how much respect I have for anyone that shoots documentary style coverage with a Leica or really just any manual focus lens because it's, it's, a, it's quite a challenge and, and I feel that now. I feel that now more than ever. If you have like the ability to set, set somebody up and just like take time to focus and set up the scene, it's no problem whatsoever, but actually documenting real life how you've seen if you're following this channel, uh, the behind the scenes wedding days, you can't really do any of that style of coverage. Uh, one thing you can actually do that I found out that you can manual focus, you can just, if you're walking and you have a couple walking towards you, you can just easily track because you don't have to do anything as long as you're walking the same speed. Just kind of have to match them that way. Uh, but everything else is really, really challenging. So uh, yeah, look forward to that video. Now we're in the dark. It is the year of the variable clouds here in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. Hopefully you can get over that, that inconsistency in, in the video footage and, and focus on the, on the lovely content. Question number one, David Brown says, what do you recommend starting uh, to learn about the quickest camera settings, posing, et cetera? I think that for at least the way that I would recommend learning, I guess, photography, if you're just like absolutely starting at zero, one, learn a little bit of the technical or at least the, enough of the technical that you need to get by in a person situation when you're communicating with somebody else and taking their image. And then I would say, as soon as you can kind of start photographing people and making that part of your, your learning process, I would recommend doing that. And I mean, setting up shoots, getting friends to go out and do photos, or if you have friends that are musicians, they always need press photos, promo photos, stuff for social media. And Usually I would say musicians and people that are used to being in front of the camera and kind of on the entertainer role side of things are usually gonna be a little bit easier to photograph overall. They're not gonna be like professional models all the time, but they're not gonna be just somebody that's completely uncomfortable in front of the camera. So um, I would probably recommend that and learning the technical, then quickly involving yourself with people and learning that aspect of things because that does change, I guess, the trajectory of how you would kind of go about learning photography, I think, that it's very easy. I feel like kind of like all things that you can very easily get stuck in the paralysis of just learning and just infinite learning and I'm not ready yet, I'm just gonna keep learning. And the faster you can break that and be like, I'm just gonna go make work, I think the, the faster you're actually going to get on track to, to find your at least kind of style or at least what makes you the happiest as far as, as far as images go. So that would be my suggestion for that. Andrew, George Miles asks, I'm looking to record value-based content videos for use with Facebook ads. Uh, do you think that I need an external mic for my Nikon Z6 or will the internal be fine? Um, also 4K or 1080. Um, so I'm gonna address this in two separate sections. One, the external microphone section. I would 100% recommend getting some sort of external microphone, uh, even if, if you follow this channel, my X-T4 preamp no longer works, but um, I have to use this, this over here. You can even get one of these packs. So this, what you're hearing my voice on right now is a Tascam DR10L, and it's a fantastic pack. I think the Wedding Photography Weekly podcast video show series, uh, last week, I think I, that was the first thing that I talked about, how great these, these are for even just like wedding day coverage, it, it's very, very helpful. Um, so I would say that it's maybe a worthwhile investment to get one of those if you think you're going to be doing video coverage um, on wedding days specifically, like it's, it's a nice to have and you'll also need it. Otherwise, I would say a shotgun microphone, the best one I would say on the market that easily connects to a camera, I would say the Rode VideoMic NTG. Um, the, the profile that it gives, at least the audio profile, I feel like feels the most natural and it's very similar to a lot of their very high-end professional NTG um, proper shotgun microphones that have to go through like an XLR and you need a recorder and everything. This just goes right into your the, the mic jack of your Nikon Z6. Uh, I would say if you have the money to invest in it, I would, I would recommend that for sure. Uh, if you're looking for something cheap, even just like the small little little what are the video mic micros, the little ball almost, um, just make sure you're getting your face really close to the camera because at a distance this far, that's really not gonna pick up well. The microphone you're hearing is from right here. So obviously the closer that you can get the distance from your, your sound source, the better the audio is going to be overall. To address part two of that question, uh, should you record in 4K or is 1080 fine? I'm gonna make an official video about this, but I think that I just 
I don't really see the value in 4K most of the time. If you're doing a Hollywood feature film and you know that your end use is going to be a huge like 40 foot screen, by all means do 4K, 6K, get, get your 12K red camera, whatever it might be. But for pretty much everything that I do and everything that pretty much all of my friends do, I would say that 1080 is totally fine for, for pretty much everything. Workflow wise, 4K is a bit of a pain, uh, especially if you don't have a top of the line computer. Uh, 1080, I feel like really every computer can handle it. My MacBook Air from 2014 can handle HD footage just fine. Uh, so I would say probably HD is totally fine. End use, if you're gonna be putting this on, on a screen, if you're gonna be running some pre-roll ads at your local uh, cinema and you're gonna, your face is gonna be 40 feet wide, then maybe consider 4K, but otherwise I think 1080 is totally fine. And even in that case, I would probably still shoot 1080 for the, for the screen since all my B-roll is gonna be in 1080 anyways, and that way it matches a little bit better. All right, next question here, Nathan asks, um, are you establishing elopement relationships with venues as they pivot themselves, um, or are couples doing more of their own thing in case of later, do you find yourself stepping into the role um, suggesting options to your clients. So this is actually um, going to be the entire course that I'm working on the month of August. So if you're interested in elopements, uh, there will be a full course coming out in August on the, the website. And if you're a member, you get access to it instantly as soon as it's out. Um, my short answer for this now is that it seems that most people I would say this is kind of going two ways. So one, it seems like a lot of people are just kind of doing their own thing and they're very fed up with wedding planning and they just want to book something. They want to book it now. And if you're available, like here's the money, like reserve the date. Uh, so speed wise, efficiency wise, booking quickness is like a 10 out of 10 right now. And also it's um, very time sensitive. Like a lot of the elopements that I'm booking are for, for instance, uh, August 20th is something that I booked today officially. So that's less than 20 days from now, which is, kind of crazy under usual wedding terms. Um, I would say that that is kind of the what I'm seeing. Venues will definitely be pushing their name or your name out there if you're associated with them. And I found that specifically with one venue that's doing a lot of elopements. So I think it also depends on the, the venue itself that if it's a venue that does a lot of elopements, it is going to be a lot more likely for them to recommend you. Um, but as a vendor on the other side of it, I wouldn't really have the visibility to know specifically which venues to approach to be like, hey, can I can I talk to you about like setting up an elopement package of some sort? Uh, the way that uh, I'll actually speak to this a little bit more, but our friend Jeff is actually the one that set up the Jeff Mack is the one that set up the, the helicopter experience, and he's been pushing it for quite some time. Jeff is an amazing officiant. Uh, he's also a member of of the group, so say hi to Jeff if you want. Uh, so he puts this all this entire package together and brings myself on or my wife Lindsay on or our friend Tim on if they want to do video. Uh, so it's like kind of this package deal that he can offer up that's a really cool experience. We are just friends, so that's kind of the way that that ended up working out. But I think that you can get together with a few of your vendor friends and put together some sort of package to, to make it very easy. And then maybe you all pool a few marketing dollars together and you, and you put that package out there into the world and, and see kind of how people respond to it. Uh, I feel like this year is the year of experimentation, that there is no roadmap, that I can't give you the five things that you need to know about marketing in your local area right now because everything is very, very different. Um, so I would say the faster you can start experimenting, the faster you're gonna start making money. Um, and even if you experiment and, and you and you don't book anything, there's a pretty good chance that somebody's still gonna hear about you and it's not gonna be lost marketing dollars because they're gonna follow you on Instagram and a year from now they're gonna end up booking you for something. And um, photography and I guess marketing Marketing is kind of weird in that space and even if you're not seeing a short-term boost in the way that you expected it to be it might always come in kind of like way down the line I guess maybe I haven't spoken to this in a while but one of the one of the key things so maybe this is uh, I'm gonna do I'm doing the little chapter so this is gonna be a chapter cut here because I think this is important um, one of the most key things I think for for marketing your wedding photography just overall really is to make sure there's as, as many touch points as you can kind of organically put out there. So for instance, somebody there deciding, hey, I, I need to look for a wedding photographer. Let's begin. I'm gonna type it, that into Google probably first. Um, maybe they know a few wedding photographers. Maybe they're already following some on Instagram. There's a pretty good chance at some point they're gonna put the, the name into Google or they're gonna be searching for their venue specifically. So point number one, I like to have some sort of some sort of SEO for pretty much every venue that I would like to target in my local area, which means that either I put together a style shoot, I go out and do it, or I do a venue review, or or I go out and I just simply take photos of the, of the space and put together a blog post based on that. So at least 
I'm ranking somewhere kind of near the beginning on that, or I'm ranking in the actual location tag on Instagram. So that can be one, that can be the other. So maybe say they found two, two points and maybe if you've uploaded those images to Instagram and now maybe they're over on Pinterest and they've repinned a few of your images, they've seen your name a bunch of times already. Now, if you hit them with a targeted ad at that point is when they're going to be a little bit more receptive that it's not gonna be a, oh, who's this? Maybe I'll click on it, maybe, maybe I'm not too invested. I'll, I'll click, I'll find out. If they've already seen your name a bunch of times, it already has that credibility uh, kind of going with it. So if you're already on, maybe say the most ideal is obviously the more, but I would say by the time you get kind of that third, your name in front of them for the third time or your image is in front of them, or maybe they sit down with the venue and they see that you're on the preferred list. By the time maybe three of those touch points go through, you're going to be they're gonna feel very comfortable with you as a photographer, which means a number of things. It means obviously that they're going to be more likely to book you, but also that they're probably going to be a much easier client to work with as well. That's not gonna come at you with 150 questions to ask their wedding photographer, that they're gonna be like, okay, like this person seems to be established. I don't know why I just kind of like and, and trust them. Um, maybe I'll ask a few questions, but I'm not like, I don't need to just go down the list of absolutely everything that I could ever ask that person. Uh, and then from bridging out of kind of the button pusher, I guess like the, the, the phase, I guess, that we all kind of begin as this button pusher where we're not really hired as artists, we're just there to fill the, the gap that, oh, we need a wedding photographer. You, you're cheap enough, like come on over, shoot my wedding. Eventually, moving into kind of the second season of your career and moving into people actually seeing you as an artist, I feel like by having multiple touch points like this, they're a lot more likely to see you as an artist and they're a lot more likely to develop some level of trust with you, especially when they look deeper into your work and deeper into your Instagram and learn a little bit more about you. Um, by that point, it's going to become very clear that you are the photographer that they would like to book, that they just seem like they like you and they don't know why, they can't explain why, but if you're available, there's a pretty good chance that you're now going to get booked. And I think that all goes down just by being in a bunch of different places uh, over time and not just ramming one single ad down anyone's throat in order to, to generate that revenue, but to be in a bunch of different places over time. So if you are advertising somewhere and you didn't see a direct response and you didn't book anything off of that ad, know that that ad can also be responsible for future bookings and it's the long infinite game, which is also going to be another video I'm going to make at some point uh, on, the, on the channel here. So yeah, those would be my, I guess like going back to the, the original question here, elopement relationships, I would put together some packages with, with friends that you can kind of run kind of anywhere, whether it's a, a coordinator, an officiant, a photographer, a video person, and really just kind of make it like that one small package that you can just kind of be like, hey, like if you'd like to get married, you'd like to do that 10 to 15 person wedding. Um, we have everything you need. It's a very turnkey operation. Make your life as easy as possible because we've already set it up with the people that we like and that we get along with. Um, that might be one thing worth, worth doing. Reaching out to venues in this time, a lot of venues are going to be very responsive because they realize they're in a very um, awkward time probably that they're probably having their lowest year of ever. Um, potentially, depending on where you live, but I would say reaching out to them can be really hit or miss. If you know of any that I would say like, I would be targeting personally higher end restaurants and or higher end restaurants within hotel areas if it's like kind of a, a resort hotel or something like that. I would be specifically kind of going after them uh, as far as trying to get relationships going because I feel like a lot of my elopements, if they're not just out in the middle of nowhere in a pretty space, um, which is happening a lot, they are probably at a place that has good food. And I feel like people just, if, if you think of like your base level wedding, it's like, what do I want at my wedding? It's like, oh, one, I wanna get married. Two, I wanna have some good food. Uh, if, you're, if you're in that mind space, you're probably looking at a higher end restaurant and you're, you're willing to spend a little bit more for that higher end restaurant because on the, the grand scheme of things, you're saving potentially like 30, 40, 50, 70, 80, 90 thousand dollars not having a full size wedding this year and you can now spend that and you can buy that fancy bottle of champagne if you want. So that's kind of what I'd be looking at. Sorry for the, the long answer to a relatively short question. Uh, Ryan Vance asks, when requiring external flash, do you still use Godox? Um, what do you recommend for external lighting when it's required? I love my, my V1, I think it's a V1, right? Godox V1, little round head guy. I am very happy with it. I see no reason to really go any more power than that on a wedding day. I also use an AD, um, AD200 Pro, uh, which is kind of a standalone off-camera flash if I ever do need one, but I would say most of the time I'm just using my, my Godox V1 or Godox if you, you wanna get back to the official real pronunciation, I guess, of the company. Um, but I would say those two 
you're gonna you're gonna be able to do a lot of a lot of good work with just those two flashes. And I think it's also important not to go too too deep into it. That the simpler you can keep your kit, the better. Um, my stance. I have some off camera flash lighting videos on on YouTube, but uh, if you watch those, my stance is really to to try to hide the the light as best as you possibly can. To never make anything look like it's a flash lit shot. Like I want. I want it to be very subtle and very hidden, um, but there are times that you absolutely do need it. All right, Sam asked, do you ever get asked or do you have uh, or included boudoir in your packages um, or do you refer them to another photographer? I personally refer people to other photographers for boudoir photography. Um, I am not a boudoir photographer and I'm also just not in the level of comfortable space, I guess, overall to just like to do that. Um, I would feel very strange doing it and I know that it's important to push past our boundaries, but I feel like that's a boundary that I'm cool with just letting somebody else do. There's more than enough fantastic boudoir photographers out there, so I just refer them to somebody else and that's the end of that, I guess, overall. Sorry for the, that was a very short answer to a question that could have been in depth. Jamie says, um, would you buy the Samyang RF 885 uh, AFF 1.4 or the EOS R? Um, I did not know that they made that Sam Yang is doing an RF with autofocus. That's very interesting. Uh, or wait for the 85 F2 in uh, October. I would personally say, unless you have an absolute need for it right now, I would probably wait for that, the Canon version of it in October simply for the IS, as you kind of mentioned here. Um, I would say that that is going to create really, really fantastic, surprisingly fantastic footage uh, overall. So I would say wait for that uh, with IS just because the way that the IS, especially if you're shooting an R5 or an R6 or you have plans to get that eventually, that the, the IS stacked with the, the IBIS is really going to make for some incredible stuff that I don't think the same Yang would be there. And also something to think about is resale wise, um, really anything that's not Nikon, Canon, like that's not first party. Sigma, I guess, maybe is kind of bridging this slowly, but a lot of other brands lose resale very drastically, whereas if you buy that Canon lens and you decide that, hey, maybe I'm not doing as much video with IS that I thought that I would require, um, a year from now, you're going to be able to sell that still for some money. But a brand like Sam Yang, I don't see a whole lot of resale. Uh, I guess like you lose a lot of your percentage rate off the start. So I would say wait if you possibly can. Um, I will personally also be getting that Canon uh, F2 IS as well. I'm very, very excited for that. And now the only lens that I'm waiting for for Canon is a 20 millimeter f1.8 or f f2 for just my general film purposes kind of like this um, when they have that i will have everything that i would ever want from the r line um, that includes the front facing screen and then i will still be waiting for my nikon z series to give me a front facing screen um, at some point but the the z5 really is my i would say my number one recommendation for wedding photography cameras just because of the price and the back catalog of like nikon lenses that you're able to purchase and there's it's got a lot of good things going for it, so I'm excited to see that camera in real life when it comes out. Uh, Nelly asks, uh, what camera or gear did you use for a food show? So yesterday or two days ago, maybe three days ago now, um, I posted a video up here that had clips of the food show. And on that food show, we use a lot of different things for the clips that I put up the other day. I would say most of it's from the Tamron 35 F1.8 with uh, VC. And I would say pretty much everything is actually from that on either my camera body or on Tim's because I think we shot most of the first season with it. So that Tamron 35 is really one of my favorite lenses. Uh, and then we would have used, I think, a Nikon D850 or maybe a D750 as well. Um, at some point, I think Tim went to the super wide Tamron. So I think he went to the G2 uh, 15 to 30, 15 to 35. Whatever the Tamron super wide is with the bubble glass in the front. Uh, at some point we started shooting with that, but for a long time, that 35 is, I don't know, just a phenomenal lens. Cassie asks, uh, who, who makes your favorite cappuccino locally or abroad? Um, hopefully this is in reference to the cappuccino song. Well, it's a pizza song, but the most memorable part in it is unfortunately about cappuccino. Um, I also pronounce it incorrectly, I guess. Hey, don't kill my pizza dreams, yo. I don't want to kill you and your dreams, yo. So don't kill my pizza dreams, yo. Uh, something cappuccino. Kappa, 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 cappuccino. Kappa, 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 cappuccino. But I would say currently right now there's a place called Death Valley's Little Brother that's up here. They make a pretty good one. There's also an Italian spot, um, La Cucina, that's downtown Kitchener that also makes a fantastic after dinner one. Um, but actually I've just, now that I've, I've said Italian place, Batista's Hole in the Wall in Las Vegas, Nevada. I would not say that this is any sort of real legitimate cappuccino. It's mostly, it's just all sugar. 
but they have one, they have an all you can drink wine option. So you sit down for dinner, you order your food off the wall and all of those meals come with all you can drink wine, which is kind of funny and, and a unique thing that I haven't seen at any other restaurants. They give you bread that's the, the best bread ever. The salad's also really, really good. The meals are also quite good, but I would say the bread and the cappuccino are my two favorite parts. Maybe the wine, the wine isn't very good. It's lot, lots of quantity, quality is getting worse every time I go. Um, but I would say that those are my two favorite parts, bread then the, the drink at the end. Um, yeah, so maybe, maybe that's my answer. If, if I'm in the mood for something that's just like all sugar, probably authentic somewhere down here, but sugar level up here. Getting, getting angry at there about, about cap, my pronunciation of cappuccino. So yeah, that would be my, my answer to that. Next question, um, as a self, uh, Amir says, as a self-proclaimed introvert, how do you market your business so well? Um, I think just by making helpful content, and I've been doing this really for the past like 15 years almost, that if I come across something that I think can help people uh, in, the, in the wedding space, that I write a post about that, or I put an article together about that, or for instance, one of my most successful posts ever was that I found a venue that had literally no information about them online and I just wrote everything that I knew and included all the images of all the different spaces that I could possibly find. And that pretty much, I would say, single-handedly booked my entire next season because it was the hot venue that no one knew anything about. Getting pretty sunny in here all of a sudden. But those, those highlights, they're gone. Don't even worry about it. But I think by just being overly helpful and just creating great, helpful content, I've talked about this a few times this week, but just becoming the guide to people, it's their first wedding ever, they don't really know what to do. If you can guide them along the process, um, you're gonna book a lot more couples and also you're gonna create content that's gonna be shared a lot more organically online as well. Next question, uh, Justin O'Brien says, regarding cropping and aspect ratios, do you prefer to keep uh, default 3.2 when delivering photos? Instagram loves 1.1 one, one, um, and 4.3 iPhone screens and monitors, 16.9, um, 16.10. I don't specifically pay attention to any crops, unfortunately. Um, I kind of crop whatever the image needs to be. And then I also, I, I kind of put a nice note in when I deliver the gallery to like, hey, maybe don't change this image. Like don't change all the colors around if you're uploading it to Instagram. And I also put a note like, please don't crop this like all crazy. Um, but I, I usually don't mind if, if things are cropped a little bit. I don't see it as like a slight against me if, if a client crops something. I think it's just that like, hey, they like it a little bit better and they were able to improve on kind of what I gave them to better suit their taste. And I think that's totally fine. Um, but yeah, I, I have no real regard to keeping aspect ratios when I'm cropping. Um, although I, I do keep roughly kind of like if it's a, a landscape image, I. I would say I, I cannot even remember a single time that I've delivered kind of a square image to a wedding couple. Um, so I, I do keep either landscape mode or portrait mode, but within those bounds, um, there's varying varying levels usually throughout the, throughout the gallery. And then the second part of the question is uh, if paying customers don't specify which ratio to prefer uh, or do crop if they request it, if so. So if somebody's ordering a print from me, I will usually, if it, if it is an extreme, like if it really changes the photo, for instance, like an eight by 10 is always the weirdest almost square crop. Um, if somebody gives me and they're like, hey, we need an eight by 10, I'll send them a proof of that to be like, hey, this is gonna be what I print, is that cool? And they'll just say yes or no. Um, but I do that free of charge because that's very, it's a very low percentage of my business is actually doing uh, physical prints. Oh, this is great, it's, it's pouring rain on this side and bright and sunny over here. It's a weird day. Wes asks, White balance, do you use auto or set custom for every scene? I set custom for every single scene. Um, this is one of the instances that I'll use automatic if things are changing and I'm not in control of my camera. If I'm behind my camera, I'm always changing it. Um, elopements, are you going to create weekday elopement packages? Yes, and I posted them up. Um, if you go to the members site, taylorjacksoncourses.com slash members, um, it'll be the first post down. It's all of my elopement packages as well as um, kind of all my normal packages and everything from kind of last year. Uh, next, <laughs> what's this next question? Can a donut be a donut if it doesn't have a hole? It just seems like a different pastry. I agree. I never thought about that. Maybe that's what a fritter is, because a fritter doesn't have a hole. I'll have to look into this more. I'll, I'll investigate and get back to you with a more thorough answer about what makes a donut officially a donut. Um, number four, with wedding season being slower, do you have, to, have you been working on music? Um, no, I haven't actually. So I've been, I would say that this year, because everything got a little bit different, usually my wedding process is very streamlined. Like, that I go shoot the wedding, outsource everything, delivery at the end of it. 
with kind of the new way everything's going, there's a lot more time involvement with me figuring out kind of how to streamline things like branding sessions and um, things like social media sessions that are all, they're kind of the same, but they're kind of all a little bit different. They all require a little bit more and some require more retouching and some require full out like um, composite putting images together that didn't, didn't even exist in real life. Um, so I would say this year I'm working more but making roughly the same amount of money in the photography space. So, um, so yeah, that's my answer. Um, and eventually I'll get another hobby again, but I don't know when that hobby will be, unfortunately. We'll see. I ordered some golf clubs. Maybe, maybe golf will be a hobby. I don't know. Look out for my, my golf channel coming up, coming up next year. Uh, Hendrick says, how do you handle when a couple move their wedding from 2020 to 2021? Do you charge extra? So depending on the date, if they're moving from like a prime date this year to a prime date next year, usually I don't. Um, I just like kind of out of kindness, I guess, I'm, I'm fine with them just moving. I've seen a lot of different people do a lot of different ways. Lindsay, for instance, if you're moving your date, you're free to do that, um, that she'll rebook that date next year, but your final payment is still due this year. So when your final payment is due um, on the contract is when that's due, but then your wedding date is next year. And she's done that for, I would say, about half of her wedding, so she's still getting paid this year. Um, I've just been moving people and their payment's still two weeks before the wedding, kind of out that way. Um, if they're doing something like, hey, they were getting married in, I don't know, like March on a Tuesday, and now they're getting married in July on a prime Saturday next year, I will um, charge extra for that. And it's, it's all, like everything's just been case by case this year, so um, I have no official, like, here's exactly how I've done it, but. I'm just doing it in a way that I, I know that it feels right and that it's kind of a fair deal for both of us and that hopefully they can understand that. And I've had a few couples move from 2020 to 2022. Um, so in that case, I do have an additional fee because that's quite a significant jump and my prices are going to be a lot different by that, by that point in, in the world. Three more questions today. Sydney asks, looking into brand social media photography, what exactly do images in that criteria look like or for different types of businesses? Other than you, I have a hard time finding more information about this niche. Um, so I, I might put together a bit of a, a video kind of based on this. Um, essentially, kind of like social media photography is anything that you would probably see on a local business's website that has a better than average uh, curated presence, I would say. Uh, a lot of people might be doing that in-house, but a lot of them are probably going out of house. There's of the I'm going to say there's maybe 100 businesses kind of up this road right here. And I'm going to guess maybe four or five, uh, maybe even like seven or eight of them uh, use an agency that comes in to do that. Um, so there are people doing it. And I think it's just important to look at who is kind of creating that, that, that look, I guess, for, for that higher end looking brand in your city and kind of deconstruct it and figure out what kind of all goes into that. You can also just go out and just start doing it and seeing kind of what works. So start maybe if, you, if your friends have some businesses or if you just want to be doing branding shots for um, like friends that might have real estate agents or whoever it might be, um, I would say just kind of start creating that and see what is the most valuable for them. And by that, I mean what they end up posting, what they end up using. Um, I would say that that would kind of be the thing that I would be doing. But I will actually look into creating a video kind of based all around that. And I might have maybe two or three shoots coming up in the next week that I can actually use that for. So that's a good idea. So thank you. Uh, Rich says, first, th thanks for naming your dog after me. <laughs> no problem. Uh, much appreciated. Secondly, uh, how do you find time for you and Lindsay with, uh, to chill without any photography involved? We, um, I don't know, like, I, I guess I just mentioned, I don't really have any hobbies. So we're either doing photography things or making videos or um, or potentially nothing. I found that by having a second place that we can go to um, is kind of helping, I would say, that we don't really do a whole lot of work up there uh, yet. So I would say location kind of also helps and, and forcing time away is kind of good. Um, but I would say overall, it's, um, I don't know, it's always kind of a balancing act and it's also a season by season balancing act that through the winter, usually more time. Through the summer, we know that it's gonna be a little bit less time. Um, but that's kind of, I guess, the nature of both of our businesses. And since we're both in the wedding photography industry, it, it kind of, I would say it's, it's easier than, than it would be if she, for instance, had a nine to five and I was only working Saturdays. So um, yeah, no real balance. Anyone that tells you that there is a work-life balance is, is a liar. Last official question coming to Cody. Um, so for our food show, we really began just with the kit that we had. So we had like our wedding day kit. Uh, the Tamron 35, as I mentioned, was kind of that key piece in the beginning. Uh, a super wide is also nice to have on a food show because you're usually in a kitchen and you're kind of all in cramped spaces. And then 
really, like, I guess it, it can go two ways. So we had Nick, so he was able to just reach out to all his friends and instantly kind of get us in any restaurant locally. So that all came through his partnership. A lot of the, the monetary uh, partnerships also came in through Nick as well, that there are companies that he's done work with or they're his restaurant suppliers that he's been using for years. So they kind of almost wanted to repay him back in a different way a little bit. Um, so that's kind of how a lot of that kind of came together. So on his side, he was, he's been amazing with just kind of setting up like wherever we want to go, no problem, let's go film it. On my side of things, I'm doing most of the editing. So we had an editor for a little bit. Tim's been editing a little bit. And then I always do kind of the final edits of most of the episodes. And that's been a learning process and we, we've tried to streamline it, but there's really no way you can kind of streamline it because every business that we go into is, is different. And I also feel like once you kind of find the template for the show and it's like, this is all the shots that we need and we need exactly three minutes of coverage out here talking before we go into the space. I feel like at that point, the show becomes very boring and not as much fun as it could be. Um, so I would say just with the gear that you have for wedding days, just putting these Tascam mics on on people, on yourself, on somebody else, and just going out and uh, talking about things that you're passionate about. If you're passionate about like whatever food it is, shawarma, tacos, whatever food you want to talk about, or do you have inside knowledge of, I think is another, another key thing. Um, or if you just want to be focusing on local areas in your city and kind of um, doing more of a, a location-based food style show or what to do in your local area show. Um, I feel like there's all kinds of different options and there's no real right or wrong way, but we just film it all documentary style. Uh, I'll see if I have any behind the scenes stuff or maybe whenever we do eventually start doing episodes of that again, I'll see if I can uh, maybe bring someone out to do a behind the scenes. But I feel like the entire show is kind of a behind the scenes, it feels like it at least. So to have another camera behind the behind the scenes might be interesting. But um, yeah, I would say just like full documentary style and just go out and have a rough idea of like, hey, for us, like if we go into a restaurant, we want to figure out usually kind of the history of what we're making. We want to make a thing and then we want to sit there and eat a thing and talk about the local area. And that's kind of the way that we've structured it. If we're doing something that involves a lot of locations, like we did a late night food episode and we just kind of bounce around from place to place. And in that case, it was just put mics on and just go out and eat food and have fun and whatever comes up along the way, laugh about it and try to make it entertaining. Um, so I would say end of the day, there's no real right or wrong way to do it, but I'll see if I can put something together. But um, it really is kind of a random process. Every time we just go, out, we try to have some fun and we try to document what that fun kind of feels like. And sometimes it comes through, most of the time it doesn't, but we get one in three, I would say. Some planning is always helpful. All right, that is all for this week. Thank you so much. If you're interested in submitting questions for next week, come over to the members only group if you're a member and you can submit that question. Uh, I'll try to give, you, give everyone a little bit more notice uh, next week rather than just posting it and then instantly coming here to record the video because I have a wedding tomorrow. So uh, yeah, look forward to that video. Look forward to the video of me failing trying to use that 90 millimeter lens and uh, look forward to the elopement course as well that's going to be coming out in August. So if you're not yet a member, sign up and you get one, you get instant access to all of the courses on the website and then two, you get access to all future courses as well as long as you're a member. So if you sign up for that year, um, the annual rate is by far the best rate. So if you're going monthly, maybe consider doing the annual um, to get everything that I make over the next year for one low, low price. So that is all for today. Thank you for being here part week two. Um, and then another video I have coming up, I'm talking with Sam Hurd at some point, maybe uh, Thursday, Friday, about um, LLCs and setting up businesses in the States. Because I'm from up here in Canada and sole proprietors and incorporations are a little bit different than LLCs and sole proprietors in the States. So I uh, thought it would be smart to talk to Sam a little bit more about that since a couple of the questions last week were about that. So uh, thanks for being here and uh, hopefully this works tomorrow. We'll find out. Actually, we'll, we'll see right now. This is, this is an important test that I should have run before now. Put it on, put it on bulb mode. Let's see, together. Does the shutter work? Oh, it works. We're halfway there. I'm gonna say 90% certain this camera functions now. We'll see when the film's developed. See you next time.